The sun shines down on Rome 1983, and as the light bounces between basilicas and frescoes of the Vatican, Emanuela Orlandi drops off ingredients for a pizza dinner at home and begs her older brother Pietro for a ride to her flute lesson. He refuses, because what older brother wants to drive his sister around? They fight for a moment before she departs, annoyed and angry. But little does he know, this is the last he will ever see of his younger sister. Emanuela left her family's apartment on Via Sant'Egidio on June 22, 1983, wearing a white t-shirt, denim overalls, and sneakers. She traveled two kilometers by bus and got out near the Piazza Navona. A traffic officer later noted that she was stopped by a young man in a green BMW. She then walked about a block to the Piazza di Santa Polinare, where she attended her flute lesson. When she finished at 7 p.m., she called her sister at home, telling her about some man who offered to pay her $200 to hand out Avon pamphlets at a fashion show that weekend. She was set to meet another of her sisters at a nearby piazza at 7.30, but she never appeared. It was the last anyone had heard from Emanuela. Emanuela's father worked as a clerk for the Papal household, so her family was privileged to be alive within the confines of the Vatican City, an autonomous city-state within the city of Rome. The Vatican, for much of its history, was a seat of power for the Papal States and the palace of the head of the Catholic Church the Pope. The Vatican gardens were available to us as if it was our own back garden. We felt we were in the safest place in the world, said her brother of the time they spent growing up in the city. Prior to Emanuela's disappearance, her friend Rafaela Gugel told authorities that she was being followed. Rafaela's father worked as a butler within the Pope's circle and after the attempted assassination of Pope John Paul II, warned her of a possible kidnapping planned in the future. She noticed a man following her on six separate days as she took the bus to school. Google, in response to his fears, transferred his daughter to a different school and would not allow her to travel around the city alone. Emanuela's friends told police that they saw men following Emanuela on two occasions leading up to her disappearance, the last occurring three days before she vanished. Claiming that a car stopped by them and a man pointed at Emanuela saying, that's her. Police initially advised Emanuela's parents to wait because teenagers like to party without their parents, but she was officially declared a missing person the day following her disappearance, June 23rd. On the 25th and the 28th of June, the family received two phone calls. The first from a man named Pier Luigi claimed that he had seen Orlandi in Rome that very same day and offered details about her clothing and flute that she carried. Since the flute was not mentioned in any public-facing information about the disappearance, this suggested to the police that this tip had some credence. Pierluigi also added that this girl was calling herself Barbarella and was running away from home to sell Avon products, another fact that Orlandi had told her sister over the phone the day she disappeared. The second phone call was from a man named Mario, made similar claims. He said that he met a young woman who went by the name Barbara, who had run away from home. He also noted that he had seen her at a bar near her music school on the day of her disappearance, which lent some credence to his claims. Both men said that she was going to play the flute at her sister's wedding in September, which very people outside the family knew, and they claimed she wanted time away from her family but would be home for the wedding. Emanuela's older brother, Pietro Orlandi, had been conducting a private investigation since her kidnapping, said it was clear they were talking about Emanuela. In the following days, many tipsters called the family with tips ranging from completely irrelevant to outright conspiratorial. The most prominent ones suggested a connection between the kidnapping and a Turkish radical group called the Grey Wolves. According to some callers, the plan was to kidnap Emanuela and use her as leverage in exchange for the man who made an attempt on the Pope's life two years prior, a man by the name of Mehmet Ali Aja. On July 3rd, hot off the trail of a visit to his native Poland, 
Pope John Paul II announced to a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder crowd in St. Peter's Square that Emanuela had disappeared. He also said that he was close to the Orlandi family and prayed for her speedy return. This was the first time that anyone suggested Emanuela had been kidnapped. Up until this point, it was still assumed she had run away. Two days later, on July 5th, a man who became known to investigators as the American would contact the family numerous times over the next few months. Most notably, he played a recording of a girl's voice saying, I'm Emanuela Orlandi and I attend a science high school. However, police did not consider it proof of life because it could have been recorded before her kidnapping. More calls from the American directed investigators to a photocopy of some sheet music that Emanuela had been studying her music school ID card, and a cassette tape that sounded like a woman being tortured. However, police told the family that it was a clip from an adult film. Investigators took this American seriously, and eventually it was patched directly from the Vatican switchboard to the Pope's Secretary of State, Cardinal Agostino Gazzaroli. Emanuela's brother, Pietro, believes that whoever kidnapped his sister wanted to discuss something with the leadership of the Catholic Church that both parties wanted to keep secret. The two magistrates who investigated the Pope's attempted assassination suggested that John Paul II was targeted to end his support of Solidarity, a labor movement in Poland which went against the interests of the local communist government. In Bosimato, one of the two investigators argued that Emanuela was kidnapped in order to blackmail the Pope. Pietro believed that the Aja angle was a red herring and the kidnappers used the controversy of the attempt on John Paul II's life and the Solidarity Movement to establish a line to the Pope to discuss the real details of the blackmail. The head exorcist for the Diocese of Rome, albeit without evidence, suggested that Emanuela was killed during an orgy by a Vatican-based sect of Satanists. It was suggested that the kidnapping was meant to draw attention away from Soviet spy agencies and instead pin the blame on radicals outside of the Vatican. For over 10 years, the case persisted unsolved. But then, in 1997, Italian police finally ended their investigation, abandoning the false KGB leads and airing their frustrations with the Vatican for their uncooperative attitude. In addition, they noted that the case was very complex and had multiple red herring. Emanuela would remain unfound. Until an anonymous call was made to a TV program called Chila Visto on the matter of Emanuela Orlandi, saying to find a solution to the case, go see who is buried in the crypt at Santa Polinare Basilica and about the favor that Renatino did for the Cardinal Poletti at the time. Renatino was a pseudonym for Enrico de Perez, the leader of the Banda de la Maliana an organized crime ring that rose to the top of Rome's criminal underworld through kidnapping, extortion, and murder. De Pettis was shot and killed by members of a rival gang in February 1990. He was buried in the Santa Polinare crypt at a time where burials hadn't taken place for over a century. This surprised most Italians. A notorious criminal buried in a place of such ancient holiness but it makes sense once you learn of the de Pettis generous donations to the poor through Santa Polinare parish priest, Reverend Piero Vagari, who sent the burial request up the chain to Cardinal Paletti, who allowed the burial even more interesting, is that this church was attached to the very music school where Emanuela was kidnapped. What favor could de Pettis have done for Paletti to get him a first class seat into the afterlife? Antonio Mancini, a high up member of the De Pettis gang said in 2011 that the Maliana gang had invested $24 million in the Roman bank Ambrosiano, which had close ties to the Vatican Bank. It was widely believed that the gang was laundering money through Ambrosiano, which then invested that money in the Bank of the Vatican. The problem was that Banco Ambrosiano collapsed in 1982, so if the Maliana gang wanted its money back, it would have to go through the Vatican. Mancini went on record to say that he believed that Emanuela was kidnapped in order to blackmail the Vatican into repaying those investments. It's possible that the favor the anonymous caller spoke of was the offer of debt forgiveness for the Vatican in exchange for de Petty's burial in Sant'Apollinare. Then, in 2008, the former lover of de Petty's, 
Sabrina Minardi said by the time the deal was struck, Emanuela was already dead. Minardi continues, saying Emanuela was held by the Magliana gang for a few months in a grotto below an apartment in a rich Roman neighborhood. She also claimed to have seen the young girl's corpse in a sack before it was dumped in a cement mixer in a seaside town south of Rome. When the lead investigator for the case went to the apartment, they found a place where kidnapped victims were kept. However, he could not determine if Emanuela was held there. Minardi also identified three former members of the Maliana gang who followed Emanuela leading up to her disappearance. To corroborate this intel, Emanuela's friends were asked to point to the men who they saw following the girl leading up to her disappearance. Investigators showed them pictures of the three men Minardi identified, alongside 100 pictures of random men. Emanuela's friends point to the same three men as Minardi. Ever since the anonymous call in 2005, Orlandi family lobbied for the Vatican to open De Petty's tomb. Seven years later, in 2012, it was. Only De Petty's remains were inside the casket, and after a year of running DNA tests on dozens of other skeletons in the crypt, they found no sign of Emanuela. Then, in 2013, 58-year-old filmmaker Marco Fassoni Acetti came forward in Kilavisto, the same television show with an anonymous caller. Acetti led reporters to a TV studio where he revealed he was in possession of a flute he claimed belonged to Emanuela. Emanuela's brother Pietro said that it looks like Emanuela's flute, but DNA tests came back inconclusive. Acetti claimed that as a student, he was a member of a radical group alleging that his group contacted De Petis for muscle on the promise that blackmailing the Pope could help both groups achieve their goals. They began to case several girls looking for anyone who would participate in their plan. Acetti said that they told Emanuela that her father was linked to the assassin and was about to be fired and that Emanuela agreed to become a hostage in order to pressure the Vatican into saving her father's job. Acetti also claimed that he was the voice behind many of the calls made to the Orlandi family and to the Vatican. However, he was adamant that if she was murdered, he had nothing to do with it. He was also jailed for six months in December 1983 for hitting a boy with his car. So if Emanuela was murdered after that time, he could not have been involved. The trail has grown cold once more. Six years later, in March 2019, the Orlandi family received another correspondence. This time, they were sent a letter with the photograph of an angel above the Teotonic Cemetery and a message saying, look where the angel is pointing. The family petitioned the Vatican for permission to explore and investigate two tombs near the location of the angel. On July 11th, the Vatican allowed forensic investigators to open up the tombs to search for Emanuela's body. Unfortunately, investigators found no evidence whatsoever in the two tombs, not to mention any bodies or caskets. The Vatican said that those tombs were likely renovated around the 1960s to 70s and the bodies moved. During this time, investigators discovered two unknown ossuaries, tombs for multiple people, under a portion of the floor in the Teutonic College. Inside, they found thousands of bones that belonged to dozens of people. Unfortunately, a forensic anthropologist named Giovanni Arcudi, who led the investigation into the ossuaries, did not find any bone structure dating back to the period after the end of the 1800s. Pietro said that the investigation into the ossuary bones was a great satisfaction to him and his family, because as he says, to think if she was buried in the ossuary all these years, just 200 meters from our house, it would be devastating. Though he was adamant about his distrust of the Vatican government, saying that the Vatican doesn't want this out and doesn't want to be seen in this way. But finally, I feel like they have taken a step back and we have moved a step forward. We may never find out what happened to Emanuela. In these kinds of cases, it's hard to not to look around for someone to blame. Why wasn't Emanuela found? Who is keeping us from the truth? The sad fact of the matter is that perhaps even with all the right circumstances and cooperation from everyone involved, she might still be missing to this day. In some ways, at least when the family is concerned, being missing is worse than being dead. You have no body to bury, no life to celebrate, and no closure. Emanuela could still be out there somewhere, and as long as there's a sliver of hope, she may come home. 
her brother waits.